Welcome everybody. We're going to give folks a few minutes to just jump on and join the webinar. We'll get started in just a minute here. Okay, well, welcome everyone. And I wanna thank you for joining us via Zoom and Facebook Live for the latest episode of the People, Planet, Public Health webinar series. My name is Lisa Wozniak. I am the executive director of the Michigan League of Conservation Voters. And we're really honored to have you uh, joining us this evening for this special event. We launched this webinar series in 2020 as a way to keep our members and the public engaged on key issues in an all virtual setting through this global pandemic that we're in. Since launching last year, we've held dozens of webinars um, and we've had engaged thousands of viewers through Zoom and Facebook Live, holding discussions on extremely timely issues around our air, our land, public health and our democracy. Last month, we were able to have a discussion with Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson about voting rights and the efforts in the legislature to suppress the voices of Michiganders. We're happy to keep this series going. And most importantly, we're very happy to have you with us today because we're about to launch into an issue and discuss an issue this evening that is near and dear to so many of us across the state the damaged, dangerous Line 5 pipeline. For many, Line 5 is an issue that really needs no introduction. The twin oil pipelines uh, are owned and operated by the Canadian oil company Enbridge Energy and pump millions of gallons of crude oil through the heart of our Great Lakes every single day. Uh, this pipeline was built in the 1950s and was only intended to operate for 50 years. We're now at year 68. In recent years, the pipeline has been subject to a number of safety violations and multiple instances of things like boat anchor strikes and disconcerting changes to the integrity of the pipeline from large patches missing from the protective coating to missing support structures along the Strait's bottomlands. By many measures, this pipeline has passed its ex expiration date and is the single greatest threat to our Great Lakes. We, along with so many of our tremendous partners in the environmental field, have been working to shut down Line 5 for years. Our calls were answered last year when Governor Gretchen Whitmer said, enough is enough. And she ordered Line 5 to be shut down once and for all to prevent a catastrophic oil spill in our Great Lakes. She gave a deadline, May 12th, next week, for Line 5 to shutter, which is right around the corner. A response that we've gotten from Enbridge, they've been blatantly defiant, asserting that they will not follow Governor Whitmer's direction and will continue to operate Line 5 illegally. So to be clear, as the title of this event suggests, Line 5 is a ticking time bomb in our Great Lakes. It's a threat to these grand waters, the drinking water of over 15 million people and our economy and our way of life. And it's time for it to be shut down. Before I introduce our esteemed guests, and we have three esteemed guests with us this evening, I would like to take a moment to show a short video that our communications team put together to help educate Michiganders, elevating and framing this critically important issue. Line 5, an oil pipeline operated by Enbridge, is a ticking time bomb in our Great Lakes, leaving Michiganders vulnerable to another oil spill. You remember Enbridge the company responsible for spilling nearly a million gallons of oil in the Kalamazoo River. This pipeline is owned by a company called Enbridge Energy Partners. It took Enbridge years to clean up the catastrophic spill and cost more than a billion dollars. Maybe the worst oil spill ever in the Midwest. The Canadian company is also operating Line 5, a 645 mile long oil pipeline built in 1953 that was only intended to safely operate for 50 years years. I represent Kalamazoo County, an area of Michigan that was impacted by a devastating oil spill. Most Michigan residents cannot fathom what a disaster like that on the scale of the Great Lakes would look like. Enbridge is a foreign company using our Great Lakes as a shortcut for their pipeline. They get all the profit, but we will suffer when the oil spills.
Today, you'll be hearing directly from some of the most uh, foremost experts on Line 5. You hear about uh, the Enbridge-owned Line 6B pipeline that ruptured near Marshall, Michigan in 2010, resulting in the second largest inland oil spill in U.S. history. You also hear from tribal representatives who have been engaged in fighting Line 5 to protect tribal rights and the vitality of our state's natural resources and economy. Our speakers this evening include Jeff Insko, professor of English at Oakland University, who has written extensively about Line 6B and the oil spill in the Kalamazoo River. Whitney Gravel, president of the Bay Mills Indian community. And Riaz Kanji, a member of the Michigan LCB Board of Directors and a tribal litigator. Before we dive into the program, I'd like to bring your attention to the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. There will be time for questions from the audience in this program. So please use the Q&A function for your questions. We'll answer as many of your questions as we possibly can in the second half of the program. And we also have folks tuning in from uh, via Facebook Live. So we have our staff monitoring comments there in the events comment section. So please put your questions in that comment section and we'll answer those two to the greatest extent possible. Finally, you'll be seeing a survey question or two pop up uh, during our program uh, about signing up for future events and ways to get involved. If you're interested in volunteering with Michigan LCV or getting involved, I encourage you to respond with a yes. With that, I would like to introduce our very first speaker, Jeff Insko. Uh, Jeff is a professor of English at Oakland University where he teaches courses in 19th century American literature and the environmental humanities. He also writes and maintains the Line 6B Citizens blog. His current book project is an environmental history of Enbridge's Kalamazoo River oil spill entitled Untimely Infrastructure, the 2010 Marshall, Michigan oil spill in the human epoch. Thank you so much for joining us today, Jeff. Uh, thank you, Lisa, so much uh, for having me uh, and thanks to you and your team for putting this webinar together and for the entire series. And let me also just say it's a pleasure to join Riaz and Whitney, both of whom uh, I admire immensely. Um, so uh, as Lisa said, uh, I live along the route um, of the Line 6B pipeline. It traverses my backyard in North Oakland County. Um, and starting in 2011, uh, we lived through what uh, Enbridge described as the replacement of that pipeline. Um, and I put that in scare quotes because um, they didn't in fact replace it. They, they put the new line, as many of you know, uh, right next to the old line and left the old one in place. Um, and that turned out to be an almost four year long ordeal um, from the time that they first knocked on our door until the time that our property was fully restored. But what that means is that I've spent now almost a full decade documenting Enbridge's activities and what I've described as their misdeeds and their misbehavior in Michigan, starting with the way that they bullied their way across the state to install the new Line 6B. Um, but I, I, I hasten to add that keeping track of Enbridge this way is not something I ever really set out to do. And I certainly didn't or couldn't have imagined back then that I'd still be doing it 10 years later. The trouble is that Enbridge just keeps providing me with new material to document. And what it all adds up to is a, is a long and pretty ugly rap sheet that extends back even before the 2010 spill in Marshall and the Kalamazoo River. And I'm sure um, most people attending today now know that that spill was the result of Enbridge's failure to take mitigating action to correct known defects on that pipeline and then their failure to follow their own safety protocols once it ruptured, which resulted in 17 full hours before they discovered and finally shut the line down. And then in the days after the spill was discovered, Enbridge dissembled and evaded and failed to disclose that the oil the line was carrying was in fact tar sands oil from the Alberta region in Canada. And that lack of disclosure also very likely made matters worse. Um, given the difficulties of, of the behavior of diluted bitumen in uh, bodies of fresh water, which had never really happened before. But, but none of that was why I started the Line 6B Citizens blog that Lisa mentioned. At first, that project was really just a, supposed to be a place where residents who were affected by the replacement project could share information with one another, because it quickly became clear to those of us um, who were dealing with it that information that people were getting was sparse, 
Uh, it was inconsistent. It was often contradictory when uh, you would talk to your neighbors. And, and soon I began to hear more and more from residents and eventually even local officials about Enbridge's shabby treatment and their heavy handed tactics and their poor communication and their disregard for local ordinances. So um, in addition to sharing information with interested residents who were affected directly by the project, I just began documenting all of it. Uh, and I've simply continued to do that ever since. Um, and I, I also wanna say that, you know, I, I mean, I shouldn't have to. Enbridge has claimed for many years that the spill in Marshall transformed them, that, that it changed the culture of the company, that they're not the same company that they were before, except that they keep making the same mistakes. And the examples of this are too numerous to enumerate here. Again, it's what I've been doing on the blog for a decade, but I'll mention just a few of the more recent ones right now. So in 2018, Enbridge paid almost $2 million in fines to the federal government for failing to comply with the terms of the consent decree that they reached with the US Department of Justice after the Marshall spill. And those fines were for failing to carry out inspections of its pipelines as required by the terms of the consent decree. In June, 2020, Enbridge paid another $6 million in fines for failing to complete timely identification and, and the evaluation of thousands of what, what are called dent features on their Lakehead system pipelines. That's line 6B, line 5, line 3 in Minnesota. Um, and to take measures to repair or to mitigate the defects in their pipelines. And again, those two were uh, conditions of the con that are listed in the consent decree. In December 2020, Enbridge was fined by the federal regulatory agency, FIMSA, for a number of violations, including failing to do a required review after a leak, not following up on aerial patrols, and in one case, federal regulators discovered exposed sections of pipe that lacked appropriate anti-corrosion coating. Just this week, we got news from Wisconsin that Enbridge violated that state's law by failing to re report a spill on a pipeline in that state for more than a year. And lawyers representing landowners in Minnesota this week allege that Enbridge is not following through on pledges made to the state's Public Utilities Commission about how it will handle its abandoned line three uh, on residents' private property there. And then, of course, um, everybody attending here today probably knows or will recall the revelation in 2017 that Enbridge knew about damage to the protective coating on line five for three full years before disclosing that information to the state of Michigan. And then as Lisa also pointed out, as of next week, when Enbridge does not shut down line five per the governor's order, they will once again be flouting uh, state law. So what we have here is not a series of isolated incidents, mistakes, mishaps, but a clear pattern of behavior. And one that at this point is pretty clear uh, is unlikely to change. So given this history, it's baffling to me that so many of our state officials are willing to trust Enbridge to do what's right rather than doing what is in the company's own interest. And so just one last quick example of such thing, and that is Enbridge's forecast and plan uh, that they can have a tunnel in which they can house a new Line 5 built and in operation by 2024, which is just three years from now. And setting aside Enbridge's equally poor track record of accurate forecasts and meeting deadlines. I could give you lots of examples of that as well. The time frame that they presented is clearly ludicrous. They're going to be hard pressed to have final regulatory approvals in that time frame. And, and then if that were to happen, who knows what sorts of delays, accidents, mishaps, weather events would delay the construction process itself. So 2034 is probably a more accurate forecast for an operational line five time. And that leads me to my last point. What's a billion dollar fossil fuel infrastructure project gonna look like from the perspective of 10 years from now? Surely it will appear even more backward looking than it does today. This is a, a moment in the life of this country when we appear finally belatedly to be taking what I think are two crucially important and long overdue steps. First, seriously confronting the climate emergency. And secondly, at long last, reckoning with settler colonial history and taking seriously indigenous sovereignty. 
prolonging the life of line five is completely at odds with both of those imperatives. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I know you're, we're going to have a number of questions from our audience for you, um, given your comments, uh, which I very much appreciate. Um, I'd like to now introduce President Whitney Gravel. Whitney Gravel is an active citizen of the D Ganoj Nakani Pl Place of Pipe, Pike, or the Bay Mills Indian Community, President of the Executive Council and former Chief Judge of the Bay Mills Tribal Court. She serves uh, currently as the Michi on the Michigan Women's Commission, and she earned her Juris Doctorate degree from, the, from Michigan State University College of Law, completing the Indigenous Law Certificate Program. Uh, we are delighted to have you with us tonight. Thank you so much, Lisa, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Ani Bojo Giwede Nagaboque Indishnikaz Ganush Nakani Nindonjaba. As Lisa said, my name is Whitney Gerbel, and I am the president of Bay Mills Indian Community. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Bay Mills Indian Community is a signatory to the 1836 Treaty of Washington, which ceded 14 million acres of land and 13 million acres of water and territory to the United States for the creation of the state of Michigan. In that treaty, Bay Mills reserved the right to fish, hunt, and gather throughout that ceded territory, which includes the Great Lakes and the Straits of Mackinac. For all my Michigan folks, you know, if you put your map up, that's essentially the northern half of the lower peninsula, as well as the eastern half of the upper peninsula. Under the United States Constitution, treaties are the supreme law of the land, and the state of Michigan and state agencies are legally obligated to honor those treaties by preserving the resources and allowing tribal citizens continued access to the waters and lands where tribal nations like Bay Mills hold treaty rights. That includes preserving those resources like fish populations and habitats upon which those treaty rights depend. And I really emphasize that point because there are no treaty rights to fish if there are no fish in the water. Although our ancestors were willing to provide land and water to the United States, they carefully protected our traditional lifeways and our reliance on the environment's natural resources for food, shelter, medicines, and for trade. Commercial and subsistence fishing continue to be the primary occupation of Bay Mills Indian community citizens all the way from treaty times until present day. Over half of our tribal citizen households rely on fishing for all or part of their annual income. When the pipeline was originally built in 1953, neither Bay Mills Indian community nor any other signatory to the 1836 Treaty of Washington were consulted about that decision to allow the pipeline to be constructed throughout our ceded territory and placed on the lake bed beneath the Straits of Mackinac. So what does that mean today? Well, Bay Mills Indian community is doing everything in its power to decommission the dual pipelines and stop the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. It's important to acknowledge tribal treaty rights as we're having this discussion on line five. Tribal nations treaty rights in this area predate and supersede any of Enbridge's interests, including any rights Enbridge may claim are vested by the 1953 easement for the dual pipelines and its subsequent orders. As Jeff elaborated earlier, um, concerns about Line 5 became more pressing in 2010 in the aftermath of the catastrophic Line 6B spill, and that's when Bay Mills Indian community started to get involved. Yet what the public may not be aware of is that Line 5 has also spilled more than 1.1 ga uh, million gallons of crude oil and natural gas in various land and water tributaries throughout Bay Mills Indian community's ceded territory. Enbridge, as Jeff also mentioned, has been fined $6.5 million for failure to maintain and upkeep the Line 5 pipeline. So although we can very thankfully say that there has not been an oil spill in the Straits of Mackinac, we cannot say that the Line 5 dual pipelines are safe. And again, I want to take the moment to remind everyone of that treaty right. State and federal agencies have an active role in protecting tribal treaty rights and resources. We need them to take action now to be proactive in their duty to protect these solemn promises made to tribal nations. When our ancestors negotiated those treaties, they reached out and they touched a feather before they signed any type of document. 
And that's because they knew that the actions they were taking would continue to provide for our people for the next seven generations. The Straits of Mackinac is also a cultural and treaty protected landscape that should not be valued as a roadway for Enbridge to get profits from a pipeline. It is instead valued by our people for the interconnectedness of the land, the water, and its relationship to our ceremonies and our traditional lifeways. If we fail to consider the significance of the Straits of Mackinac, uh, the significance of the Great Lakes and the resources and value that it provides our families, not only to tribal nations, but also to citizens of the state of Michigan, we risk threatening those treaty protected resources. We risk threatening the culture and tradition of Bay Mills Indian community and other tribal nations. And we risk destroying a way of life for our people. Um, the Straits of Mackinac have somewhat been described as a garden of Eden for indigenous people. Our creation story takes place in the Straits of Mackinac. Our relationship with the water and ceremony takes place in the Straits of Mackinac. And that is where we as a people were created. And when we threaten the Straits of Mackinac with an oil spill, with a pipeline, as we have already been for more than 50 years, as Line 5 runs throughout the Straits, throughout the ceded ter territory, throughout the state of Michigan, we actually risk destroying what the Anishinaabe people in Michigan consider the heart of Turtle Island. We all know that the Great Lakes is the largest freshwater body resource in the world. And we see that as the heart of North America. And we know that without the Great Lakes, we could not continue to exist. At present, the tribe is not only deeply concerned about the environmental stressors that come from line five, such as climate change, invasive species, chemical pollutants, and habitat destruction that will all combine to have a significant and perhaps permanent adverse impact on the tribal fishery and our treaty protected resources but the operation of the current line five and the prospect of sitting and constructing a tunnel in the Straits area for transportation of petroleum products is the most obvious and preventable risk to these treaty rights, to the supreme law of the land that we can prevent throughout Northern Michigan. Our people, the Anishinaabe have a teaching and I call back to my ancestors that originally signed that treaty and that teaching tells us that the decisions we make today should take into consideration a sustainable world for the next seven generations. It reminds us to understand that the decisions we make are not limited to the immediate concerns or the immediate profits that we might see today as Enbridge has been spinning in the media. But instead that teaching reminds us that the implications will be here long after we are gone. So today, we join our guests here and we join all of you to urge state and federal agencies to adopt that teaching as well. As my ancestors have long taught my people, um, it's an Anishinaabe phrase and it means and it is water that gives us life. So thank you. Thank you so much, President Gravel. I know there will be a lot of questions for you as well. Um, we are now moving to our, our final esteemed guest for this evening. I'd like to introduce my friend Riaz Kanji. Riaz is a board member of the Michigan League of Conservation Voters and a founding member of the law firm Kanji and Kotzen. He is the directing attorney for their Ann Arbor office representing Native American tribes in fields spanning treaty rights, sovereignty protection, taxation and regulation, land claims and land use, reservation boundaries, gaming and economic development and environmental protection. Riaz has played a major role in the legal challenges to the Line 5 pipeline. I'm delighted to have Riaz join us this evening. Riaz, the floor is yours. Thank, thank you very much, Lisa, and thank you to MLCV for this uh, wonderful series. And it's a pleasure to be here today and to follow on those very uh, powerful remarks by both uh, President Ravel and, uh, and Professor Insko. I will touch just for a few minutes on the the current legal status of the, the, the Line 5 challenge. And, and I hope in doing so to underscore the, just the fundamental importance of the legal principles at stake uh, in, in this battle. The, uh, as, as I think many people know, Enbridge can operate uh, Line 5 
uh, under the Straits of Mackinac by virtue of a 1953 easement that the state granted to Enbridge. Uh, the state uh, owns uh, the bottomlands under the state, uh, under the Straits. It does so pursuant to really a fundamental constitutional doctrine, the, the equal footing doctrine, which provides that when states came into the union, each state assumed ownership of all submerged lands under navigable waters. And the Supreme Court has long viewed that as a fundamental attribute of state sovereignty. Uh, in Michigan and many other states, that ownership of the sub submerged lands comes impressed with, with the public trust, uh, that the state owns those lands but cannot convey them or impair them in pursuit of private gain or, or at the behest of private interests but owns those lands, holds them in trust for the public and always needs to keep that public trust uh, paramount. Uh, in 1953, when the state conveyed the easement, I think it's fair to say that uh, environmental concerns were not uh, top of mind uh, and that there was really very little attention paid uh, to the destruction that could be caused by laying a pipeline uh, underneath what President Gravel so eloquently described as as sort of foundational fundamental waters for the indigenous peoples in the state and really all peoples in the state. Um, what uh, Governor Whitmer and Attorney General Nessel uh, have declared uh, in, in the last two years in, in very powerful terms is that they uh, are the guardians of that public trust and that when that easement was conveyed without, without proper attention of public trust principles, um, it, that, that simply could not happen, that the easement remains impressed with the trust and that in the exercise of proper concern for, um, for the environmental destruction that could be caused by a pipeline rupture, uh, the governor in November revoked uh, the easement um, on that basis and also on the basis that Enbridge had failed to comply with uh, fundamental conditions in the easement, maintaining the pipeline in, in proper condition with respect to matters, including a pipeline coating, a proper support for the pipeline and the overall exercise of, of due care with respect to the pipeline, um, largely based on, on some of the factors that Professor Insko touched upon, the failure to disclose at many points in time, uh, material facts related to the, the safety and integrity of the pipeline. So the really the state acted both as a sovereign in exerting uh, its public trust rights and as a property owner in, in exercising its, its rights under the easement. Um, what Enbridge has uh, argued in return is that the states, the governor's ability to, uh, to act in, in protection of the public trust and in protection of the state's rights as a property owner, that her hands are tied, um, that she is not able to do so by virtue of both federal statute and a 1977 treaty with Canada. Uh, and it, it argues that both the Pipeline Safety Act and, and the treaty sort of override the state's fundamental uh, sovereign prerogatives. I think that argument you know, um, flies in the face of what the Supreme Court has uh, consistently accorded as the fundamental uh, federalist powers of, of the states that the federal government cannot override core state sovereign prerogatives uh, be it by treaty or by statute, uh, and it cannot do so absent a very clear you know, indication that that is the intent of the, the federal government. Nowhere in, in the, uh, the treaty with Canada that Enbridge has been emphasizing so heavily both in court and in, in, in the media uh, or in any federal statute, uh, is there any indication that the state of Michigan and, and the governor were stripped of the power to protect something so fundamental as the Great Lakes through the, uh, the assertion of um, a continued interest uh, in the public trust and an assertion of, of states own rights under, under the easement. That's where the legal battle will get, uh, will get played out. Um, what has happened uh, is that the, you know, the effective date of the governor's order uh, is May 13th. Uh, as of that date, oil is supposed to cease flowing through the pipeline. Enbridge will be in intentional trespass. If it continues the flow of oil, uh, but Enbridge has made it very clear that it will not stop that flow of oil absent a, a court order um, requiring it to do so. And at the same time has made it impossible for there to be a court order as of May 13th, because while the attorney general filed action in state court 
to vindicate uh, the validity of the governor's order, did so immediately in November. What Enbridge then did was uh, sought to remove the case to federal court. It argued that the state courts don't have authority to define these fundamental issues of state law, like the scope of the public trust. Uh, so what's happening now in federal court is that that jurisdictional issue is being hashed out, the question of whether the case should stay in federal court or return to, uh, to state court. And that will take uh, a number of weeks or even months beyond the effective date of the governor's order uh, to, to get hatched out. So you see there's a situation where Enbridge is saying, we won't uh, comply with anything but a court order, court order, but they've made it impossible for there to be a court order of uh, as of May 13th, um, which you know, in the view of many, will put them uh, in intentional uh, trespass and, and flouting. Uh, flouting a fundamental order of the uh, the governor of the state of Michigan, uh, and it will be very interesting to see how all that plays out uh, on that date and, and going forward. Thank you, Rias. Thank you very much. And uh, we're going to turn now to questions from the audience. And I want to remind everybody that if you're joining us uh, via Zoom, you can click the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen and you can submit your questions there. And if you're joining via Facebook Live, please submit your questions um, in the comment section and we're monitoring both of those areas. So um, Riaz, I think you've answered in part uh, the questions that are coming from one of our guests this evening. Marge is just sort of incredulous about how Enbridge has so much power that they don't have consequences for their failure to follow the rules. And she asks if 50 years was the time frame for line five, how can Enbridge tell Michigan um, that they will continue. And she, the other part of her question is about the University of Michigan study and the evaluation of the safety and the ability of line five to remain safe and wondering if that carries any weight in shutting the pipeline down. I think that should go first to you, Riaz, for any thoughts and a response there. So a two part response. First, uh, with respect to the 50 years, you know, that was the projected uh, timeline for um, the integrity of the pipeline. Uh, but I think it is important to note that the easement itself does not have an end date on it. And, you know, unfortunately, and this is sort of a, in contravention of what President Gravel defined as like the seventh generation principles, uh, the Michigan governmental officials in 1953 did not have the wisdom to put a fixed end date on, on the easement. But as I say, the easement came impressed with this public trust notion and what the governor and the attorney general have done now is to say, look, whatever people thought then, we understand now, we all understand the perils of pipelines and especially the perils of pipelines operated by Enbridge. And we are uh, not bound by what happened in 1953 because our fundamental obligation is to the, the people of the, of, of the state. Um, so, and then with respect to the second part, the University of Michigan study, I think has been very influential in the development uh, over the last few years. And what that study showed was just how catastrophic uh, a spill would be from, from, from the pipeline, because by virtue of the, the currents in the straits, really you know, 700 plus miles of shoreland and the associated waters in both Lake Huron and Lake Michigan would be destroyed if there were to be a, a rupture of, of, of the pipe. May I, may I jump in and add something, Lisa? Sure, absolutely. So, so um, yeah, just, just in addition to um, Riaz's remarks about the, um, the protection of the public trust. Um, the, you know, the governor's action is also rooted not just in the public trust doctrine, but the simple violation of the terms of the easement. Um, and so um, the, the part of the governor's claim is that it, it, it enumerates a, a series of ways that Enbridge has violated the terms of the easement and rendered it um, null. Um, and uh, with regard to the removal or the federal preemption argument that Enbridge is making, I mean, I can tell you as a just as a, a landowner who was concerned about um, a pipeline project on my property that you know federal regulatory bodies and agencies don't want any part of private disputes between um, pipeline companies and states or individuals, um, and so. Um, the governor and the attorney general have been very clear that this is not about pipeline safety, which is indeed a federal jurist, under federal jurisdiction, but this is simply about the terms of the easement in, the pub, in, in addition to the public trust doctrine. 
one one just one other point I'll add quickly is mm -hmm. that uh, you know we represent the Bad River Band. Line five passes through the Bad River Reservation before it reaches the Straits of Mackinac, and there uh, Enbridge's easements have in fact expired. They expired in in twenty thirteen for uh, various segments of of the pipeline right away across the reservation. But there Enbridge still continues to uh, operate the pipeline and, and the flow of oil. So whether it's because you know there's a fixed end date on the easement because there are, uh, as, as, as Jeffrey says, easement violations uh, or because of the public trust, whatever the reason is, Enbridge is very willing to flout, um, flout those reasons and concerns and to continue the, the flow of oil. Thanks to both of you for those, those answers. Um, I'm going to keep us going on some questions. There's there's one that we might all want to weigh in on a little bit, and there's another one teed up sp specifically um, for President Gravel. Um, one of our guests, David, has asked about our, if there are any efforts to get uh, entities like Michigan Public Radio and others that take money from Enbridge to stop doing so, and is there you know any effort that you know, to really boycott everything and anything that Enbridge owns? I'll I'll quickly say that. Um, as to, to begin this, that, that we're very aware of uh, the sponsorship of Michigan Radio and partner groups of ours have raised that that's a conflict of interest for the, the radio um, and its reporting. If anyone would like to make their voices heard on that, I would encourage you to contact uh, Michigan Public Radio and their corporate sponsorship director, Holly Eaton. Um, her email address is uh, heaton, H-E-A-T-O-N at umich.edu. Um, and I think that they need to hear from all of us. Um, I don't know if any of our other of our guests would like to weigh in on on that question. Otherwise, we can keep moving. Okay, I, I'd like to move to this question from Gary um, for President Gravel. Um, given the threat to the Great Lakes and impact Line Five has uh, uh, in, in carbon emissions, has um, has President Biden indicated any interest in seeing Line 5 closed down, shut down? Yeah, thank you, Lisa. Unfortunately, we have not heard a lot from President Biden or this administration on Line 5. Most of the pressure that has been mounting on Line 5 has been coming from the Canadian government. Uh, the White House has taken a position on the Keystone XL pipeline and um, as we know, there are various and numerous pipeline fights occurring ac across the country right now. One of the things that we're extremely worried about is that Line 5 may get lost uh, in terms of attention that is being brought to it. Um, we don't see a lot of media attention surrounding it. We also do not see a lot of, um, I think, activist effort around it currently. And that's one of the struggles that we continue to have with Line 5. You have the public in the state of Michigan who do not want line, line five. You have tribal nations in the state of Michigan who do not want line five. Yet we are stuck in this conundrum where the pipeline exists. And that was a mistake that was made a very long time ago. And it's something that we're all actively participating in and trying to rectify for the future. Uh, not only are tribal nations involved, you know, Riaz is, is representing a number of groups and there's a lot of environmental organizations. And now combined with the governor's effort and revoking the easement, we are at a critical turning point where we can actually stop line five, get it decommissioned, as well as stop the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. The tunnel project has not been built and all parties agree that the dual pipelines as they reside currently in the Straits of Mackinac are dangerous. And if they're dangerous, they need to be removed. Thank you. And I think this is a good follow-up question. And it might be both for you, President Gravel, and, and for others. What other indigenous and legal organizations are, are supporting the effort to shut down the pipeline? So all 12 tribes in the state of Michigan have actually passed resolutions asking for decommissioning of Line 5, as well as stopping of the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. Um, and there are several org organizations that are also helping support indigenous voices um, in this matter. Tribal nations specifically engaged in litigation include Bay Mills Indian Community, the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians, the Grand Traverse Bay Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. Um, but we have a lot of support from our sister tribes in this effort, as well as environmental organizations such as Oil and Water Don't Mix, Clean Water Action, and then 
very specifically um, Earth Justice and the Native American Rights Fund have stepped in uh, to help Bay Mills Indian community in this fight. They are the environmental and the tribal treaty law experts and they've really been amplifying our voices and, and helping us as we navigate these numerous battlefields um, that we're currently engaged in on line five. Maybe I'll pivot this quickly to Riaz. I know that a number of attorneys general have also jumped in and made their voices heard in support of the governor's actions. Do you want to maybe say a couple things about that? Yes, uh, there, there, there have been. There was an amicus brief filed on behalf of the state by a significant number of states, and the reason um, goes back to what we were discussing a little bit earlier. The principles here are so fundamental in terms of. Uh, state sovereignty and the ability of states to protect uh, their situations in, in the face of threats like that posed by the pipeline. And what the states essentially said is like, look, what the governor and the attorney general have done here are exactly what we would want to be able to do with respect to protection of our citizens and our fundamental sovereign prerogatives. And Enbridge's attack is really uh, an attack on our fundamental constitutional structure and the ability of states to act in, in protection of the public health and the welfare. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question for Jeff in regards to, you know, who who paid the billion dollars to clean up the Kalamazoo River? <laughs> um, well, I mean, in one way, I mean, in one way, it's a simple answer, but it's also kind of a complicated answer. I mean, I mean, essentially, Andrews paid to clean up. They paid the billion dollars to clean it up, except that there are all kinds of other costs um, for cleaning up that spill that. Um, the brunt of which were borne by all kinds of other people, like, for example, the people who were dis who, who were displaced and lost their homes. That, I mean, they're they're in a way paying for the spill too. Um, but, but I mean, Enbridge, Enbridge paid for the spill. Um, however, the, the other caveat to to the, in response to that is that is that um, like um, you know, Enbridge embarked upon the replacement project in the wake of that spill. Um, they said for safety reasons, um, but really it was a business decision that um, there were limits placed upon the volume of by the federal regulators upon the volume of oil that Enbridge could pump through the old line because of um, known deficiencies and con safety concerns. Um, and so they invested in replacing 210 miles of it, much of which was larger diameter pipeline. And so ultimately Enbridge was able to um, send more oil through line 6B than they were sending through it before, um, which was an economic boom for them. Um, so in a kind of perverse way, um, even with the billion dollar cleanup effort and the expenditure of the new infrastructure project, um, you know, the replacement of line, the, the spill and the replacement of line 6B were like a net economic gain for Enbridge. So a number of our, our guests this evening have questions about the legal battle. And so I'm gonna to go to a couple of those questions. Um, I'm gonna to go to Jennifer's questions, which are at, you know, about the ability of the state to seek an immediate injunction to stop the flow of oil while mediation in the court case continues. And likewise, whether Enbridge can seek a stay to prevent the oil from stopping. Like, so I'm trying to understand the legal pieces of this, and is this should this go to you, Riaz? I, I can I can answer quickly, and President Gravel may have something to add, but uh, yeah, that this is the conundrum. I, I think this is the situation that Enbridge has set up. I think honestly, when the um, governor filed their notice in in November, uh, I think what many people expected would happen would be that between November and May. Uh, the legal issues would get hashed out, you know, the ability of the state to act on the public trust, whether the easement conditions had in fact uh, been violated and that those would get hashed out in, in, in state court uh, and that there might be appeals up, but it would all move fairly quickly with everyone treating the May deadline as a, as a serious deadline. But instead, by filing this removal action, the federal court, and let's be clear, the reason why Enbridge did this is not out of principle, it's because they think they've got a greater chance of success in federal court uh, by removing the action uh, to federal court, they've created this sort of jurisdictional limbo. So uh, the, the direct answer to the question, the state cannot presently seek an injunction in state court to shut down the flow of oil. It cannot do that by May 13th. When, once a case is removed to federal court, uh, the state court is stripped of jurisdiction unless the federal court then decides, you know what, this case doesn't belong here. These are really state law issues 
and this should get sent back. And that's what's getting argued in front of the federal court right now. At the same time, the state um, is not really in a position to go into federal court and ask for that injunction because it doesn't think the federal court has jurisdiction and properly believes the case belongs uh, in, in state court. So there is this fundamental limbo uh, that's been created by sort of by Enbridge's litigation tactics. Now the state, you know, we'll see what happens over this next week. It's possible the state will seek to take other actions. Uh, the state clearly believes um, that that May 13th deadline was meant to have real teeth to it. Um, but in terms of an actual ability to get an injunction, uh, that's, that's very difficult right now. Thank you. Um, a few of our guests have asked about the name of the federal court case, and if you would be so kind as to actually say, say that, Riaz, and then maybe we can put it in uh, in the Zoom chat or whatever to get it to people. It's, a, it's State of Michigan versus Enbridge, and it's pending in the Western District of Michigan in, in front of Judge Neff. Great. Okay, so um, Got some more really important questions here, so get ready, panelists. Um, uh, Enbridge claims that because FIMSA has supposedly determined that Line 5 is quote unquote fit for service, the state can't shut it down. Has FIMSA ever determined that a pipeline is not fit for service? Oh, oh that's Jeff, a really ahead. interesting question. Um, I, uh, I, I can't say categorically, I cannot answer that question. Uh, my colleagues at the Pipeline Safety Trust surely can, and I will ask them and um, get a definitive answer to that and post it on the blog or something like that. Um, but but, I, but I, can't, I can't say this, like if, if PHMSA has ever done that, it would, it would be an exceedingly rare action that, that PHMSA is not in the, really in the business of shutting pipelines down. PHMSA is um, a, a rather toothless federal agency that is really there to facilitate the operations of pipelines. And for them to declare a pipeline unfit for service in all likelihood would not entail decommissioning it or shutting it down. Uh, it would simply order various kinds of remediating or mitigating um, measures um, to return it to the status of fit for service. Um, I, I, I'd be hard pressed to imagine PHMSA uh, exerting its authority um, so far as actually shutting a pipeline down um, rather than just requiring various actions to bring it up to federal regulatory code, um, codes which are by and large written by the industry in the first place. So let's go to a question for President Gravel. Um, Thomas wants to know, do you think that the discovery of an ancient tribal settlement on the lake bed of the Straits of Mackinac might carry legal weight to stop line five in the tunnel? Um, sort of, and that kind of gets into the legal analysis of how the United States and those federal and state laws actually provide protection to archaeological resources. However, um, as this uh, question asked, there was findings of our ancient archaeological resources on the Straits of Mackinac by some tribal activists last fall. And I know that that site and that um, archaeological finding has been undergoing studies. Uh, but what's more important to identify is what that resource and what that finding actually identifies in the Straits area. And that's something that tribal nations have always been saying all along, is that it is embedded as um, a cultural resource within our lifeways. Uh, the Straits area is actually been recommended by the State Historic Preservation Office, as well as several tribal nations to be a traditional cultural landscape or a traditional cultural property. And what that means is under um, the law, that area, that landscape, that watershed actually carries such significance to the culture of a traditional people or to the history of a traditional people that it should be provided additional protections. Um, however, you know, given the status of the law in that, what it requires then is if the Straits area is identified as a traditional cultural landscape, it only requires that they mediate or mitigate 
the damages of that project occurring within the Straits area. And we've been engaging in active conversation with the United States Army Corps of Engineers. They're currently going through what we call a Section 106 consultation process, where they look at and identify all of those historic and archaeological sites within the Straits area. And a really big question that has been looming is there's a, a contradiction between how tribes value cultural resources and how I would say Western law values cultural resources. So Western law was written to protect specific sites. You have a site number, you have a burial mound, you have an archeological site that you know, should be um, protected, researched, you know, um, prevented from any type of looting. Um, but what traditional cultural landscapes look at, look at is your relationship with the land, which is something that tribal nations uh, rely on as part of our traditional life ways. And the big question that we've been asking these state and federal agencies is how do you mitigate harm to a culture? How do you mitigate harm to a people? Because that is what is going to occur if this pipeline continues to exist and if the Great Lakes Tunnel Project is built. Uh, not only could these specific archaeological resources be damaged by the construction that is occurring, but you're also risking and damaging uh, that cultural uh, relationship. And so far, you know, we've asked several state and federal agencies, how do you mitigate harm to a culture? And they don't have an answer for us. And that's something that we're trying to protect right now. You can't replace going to a location and, and performing ceremony. You can't replace catching whitefish and having that be your first meal to your newborn. You can't replace going out and harvesting berries and, and being part of your berry fast. That's how it's interwoven into our life ways. So that's the big question hanging out there is yes, there is proven archeological resources in the Straits and we're trying to prevent harm to them and harm to tribal nations. Thank you. I'm going to shift to a question. I think this is probably best um, going to Riaz. It's a question about Enbridge's um, positioning of the tunnel as occupying a different easement agreement, one that was created by the Snyder administration. Is this a view that's universally held? And this is a question posed by uh, our guest, Lisa. I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick answer, and then I'm going to defer to President Gravel because Bay Mills has really taken a huge leadership position in the, in the fight against the, the tunnel. Uh, but the, the sort of the quick answer is the, the tunnel is uh, pursuant to a separate easement. The state um, did grant a separate easement for the tunnel, but it's very important to keep in mind that that was just the first part of the tunneling process and the ability to actually build that tunnel uh, then requires the granting of various permits um, by state and federal agencies. Uh, some of which uh, uh, Eagle has now granted and which Bay Mills is, is challenging, uh, some of which remain to be considered, and then action by the Public Service Commission. And one very interesting thing, I think, is we have a very different Public Service Commission now than we did when uh, what Jeffrey was talking about when line the replacement line 78 was was uh, was allowed and the public service commission is meant to consider you know the need for the pipeline the availability of alternatives it recently ruled that it will consider climate change considerations um, so there there's a very long way uh, for that process to, to play itself out i don't know if president gravel wants to add anything to that no you you covered everything riaz um I, I guess just to summarize for the folks listening there is litigation taking place before the michigan public service commission the michigan public service commission will decide if enbridge is allowed to move the dual pipelines into a tunnel so if they actually deny that the tunnel can't be built simultaneously there are two permits before two different agencies one is the united states army corps of engineers they hold a dual permit that must be issued along with the Environment, Great Lakes and Energy Department in Michigan. And we did just see in January that Eagle uh, did conditionally approve permits for Enbridge to build the tunnel, which is the first set. Um, and Bay Mills Indian Community uh, just last Monday actually filed a petition contesting that issuance of the permit directly related to those cultural resources. So um, Eagle has a separate independent 
authority to determine if cultural resources exist in the Straits area and if we're mitigating that harm to those cultural resources. And instead, um, EGLE actually ignored recommendations from the State Historic Preservation Office, which was asking for additional cultural surveys to be completed um, and issued the permits despite those recommendations and despite that ask for additional work to be done. And they kind of kicked it down the road to the United States Army Corps of Engineers which was completely inappropriate. Uh, so Bay Mills is continuing its battles um, on all of those fronts uh, to stop the Great Lakes Tunnel Project. And I think that really summarizes where we're at um, on all fronts. You know, Not only do we need to stop the tunnel, we also need to decommission the dual pipelines if we really wanna see line five removed from the state of Michigan. I know we're getting close to time, but I wanna make sure one more question is asked and answered. And that is very importantly, a question from Wendy about um, President Gravel, you mentioned that the Canadian government uh, has been vocal in this. What is their position and what's the role that it, you know, as it relates to the pipeline? The Canadian government um, has been in talks with the White House about keeping line five operating. However, what we're seeing that has kind of been spun up over in Canadian media is the same things that we've been seeing spun here in Michigan, uh, that there's gonna be a loss of jobs, that you know uh, fuel prices are going to skyrocket. And we're seeing the same situation play out in Canada where um, their media resources, their environmental organizations are now working to actively debunk those media spins that we see from Enbridge. And I shouldn't even say spins, they're actually lies. You know, most of what Enbridge says as it relates to jobs, as it relates to environment has been debunked. We saw them say that propane prices here in the Upper Peninsula were going to skyrocket. And then the Upper Peninsula Energy Task Force says it's five cents on the gallon and that there are other ways to transport those products. We see Enbridge say that they're going to promise jobs to Michigan residents or Canadian residents. And we see study reports from Minnesota that show on the line three work, only 25% of Minnesota citizens actually received any type of work from the line three build when Enbridge was promising anywhere from 75% to 80%. So these are the same media spins that Enbridge has used in Minnesota. They've used them in Michigan and now they're using them in Canada. And for those of you that don't know, Bay Mills is right on the St. Mary's River, you know, we can look across to Canada, we can see you, uh, we know that you're there. And I just wanted to remind all of our Canadian friends and relatives that I have seen you move forward in terms of green energy. If you look across the St. Mary's, there are more than 50 wind turbines up. And I remember thinking 10 years ago, like how wonderful that was that Canada was taking, taking steps towards a renewable future. So to see them double down on the pipeline and kind of forget that progressive Canada that used to exist is, is really disappointing. But I do believe that they'll continue that work to debunk those and bridge lies and, and realize the truth as we have all done here in Michigan and, and in Minnesota. I am going to ask you quickly, because I know we have to wrap up. People are very interested in what they can do. What can people do to get involved, to help, to be a, a part of actually making sure that this pipeline is shut down? <laughs> Quick responses from our panelists. Uh, I think the best thing you can do is amplify the voices that are already there, you know, reach out to organizations, call your congressmen, call your senators, call your state representatives, they need to hear from people and they need to hear from a lot of them because uh, those smaller voices, we don't have the resources to combat Enbridge's billion dollar machine. And it's really only through working together and uniting and amplifying all of our voices on this issue that I really think will be heard. So, you know, educate your friends, educate your family, and edu educate your representatives, and don't be afraid to vocalize the future that you want, not only for yourself, but also for your children. Well, I want to thank our, our panelists. Um, I think we um, ended with President Gravel's comments here in regards to the lack of integrity of this corporation, where we started, which was with Jeff's comments about the lack of integrity of this corporation that has such a tremendous 
potential and, and, and existing impact on our Great Lakes, our drinking water and our way of life. So um, thank you for such a thoughtful um, and important conversation. I also wanna thank all of you who tuned in tonight and for your important questions. Um, I'd like to open a quick poll question for those who are tuning in. We are ramping up recruitment of volunteers to do a lot of things, including play a role in this line five battle, um, work on, on preserving our democracy and, 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 and get involved in our electoral work. And we're using Zoom to engage and train new volunteers. So if you're interested at all in plugging in and volunteering, please respond with a yes to the poll that you'll see. Um, and one of our organizers will get in touch with you ASAP. Um, the fight to, to shut down Line 5 has been long and difficult, and it continues, and I'm confident in saying that we would not, we collectively would not have gotten to where we are today with Governor Whitmer's order to shut this pipeline down without the tireless efforts of all of you, certainly our esteemed guests, and all of you who have been part of this. Um, for staying engaged, thank you. For making your voices heard, thank you. And we at Michigan LCV, I promise you, will continue to stand up for our Great Lakes and our economy and our health and work with our partners across the, 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 the sphere of, of interest on, on this um, as we hold Enbridge Energy accountable and shut this pipeline down. So thank you for joining us today. Be well, be safe, and we will see you next time. Take care.